Um, I actually wanted to just say that I loved the um, the rapid oral abstract that was that you were, I think, a co-author on, um, trying to understand in a retrospective way what patients with chromophobe kidney cancer um, respond best to, and looking over, um, I think it was over a hundred patients. Um, I don't know if you want to comment a little bit on that. In, in the double digits, now getting to 100 patients. Yeah, absolutely, and always a pleasure to talk about the, the rare subtypes. I think that um, what is very exciting, and, and, and you can see it now, is that people are starting to think that, oh no, these therapies that were developed for clear cell renal cell carcinoma are not meant to work that well for the other subtypes. They don't work at all for, let's say, renal medulloid carcinoma. In fact, they may sometimes even feed renal medulloid carcinoma. And people are seeing that we can actually do biology-driven research that can improve the outcomes of these patients, even though we cannot do randomized trials. Randomized trials is just one tool to get the job done. And along these lines, the chromophobe community, and this large, in large part came from the chromophobe patient advocates who said, hey, you now have you know, a few renal medullary carcinoma dedicated biology-driven clinical trials, and we still don't have a single chromophobe renal cell carcinoma specific trial. Can we do that? And the idea was, well, first of all, we need collaboration. So we need a lot of institutions to collaborate. You can, this cannot be just you know, one person's job or whatnot. And we need first some clinical data. Get a little bit of a sense of, hey, what are the patterns? What are the observations to guide as well as research as you know very well. Like without clinical observations, you cannot guide your fundamental research. And so what was found? It was found that if you start patients with doublets, which again, they were not developed for chromophobe kidney cancer, you give two therapies that maybe have some efficacy in chromophobe, yeah, that's better than one sunitinib, let's say. But this by no means says that, let's say, immunotherapy, the current immune checkpoint therapy is effective against chromophobe as much as we want, whether alone or with the TKIs developed for clear serenal cell carcinoma. So these are good patterns um, to now have, and there will be more coming from these collaborations, but by no means do we want to tell people, this is it. Uh, we need biology-driven trials for chromophobe and for the other subtypes, you know, F8 deficient, translocation RCC, tremendous opportunities, tremendous excitement to learn, for renal cell carcinoma and across ca cancers. Mm -hmm. And do you think, so, you know, I think in that data, just the initial clinical observations, as you said, using drugs developed for the most common clear cell type, but that, you know, it looked like about 50% of patients did benefit from an IO. So I wonder, you know, to take the next steps and to think about our advancing uh, drug development, advancing technologies. Do you think the the next step is okay? We have these clinical observation in a cohort of 100 or 200 patients, and now let's subtype them or um, gene expression or DNA and out, you know, whole exome sequencing or. What do you think the lowest hanging fruit is there? And exactly, and that was one question. So we were actually very interested in what people were going to ask um, because you get useful feedback. And one question that was asked consistently was, "Hey." What about you know the subtypes? What about if you have sarcomatoid chromophobe, which tends to be more p53 mutated, etc.? Like, what are you seeing there? And these are patterns to 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 look into and biology to tease out. And exactly as you said, in fact, we published with Rahul Seth, literally the trial design. It's ready. It's like the stats are ready. If you have a, a strategy that you think could turn a cold tumor, because that's what chromophobe is, versus, let's say, renal medullary carcinoma, which also doesn't respond to the standard immune check with everybody, it's hot. Chromophobe is more cold than, than those tumors. That can turn this, and you believe in it, here is the strategy that you can use to add this to, let's say, an EVOEP backbone without needing hundreds of patients, 20 to 30 patients, realistically, with metastatic chromophobe. And here is, you can do the correlatives and advance the science. Even if this trial ends up being negative, if you do the correlatives, you're going to learn. Yeah, I love that. Um, you know, sticking with kind of non-clear cell and the, the 
data that we've seen, um, you were just bringing up the, the FH uh, variants. And so I wonder if uh, anyone here has any specific passion for the other non-clear cell types that you have excitement for, you know, how we should be treating those patients. Example, you know, papillary, um, based on kind of recent trials, we have PAPMET2, or PAPMED, I guess. And um, we will have Pat Metz. Yes, we yes, will. But. Yes. <laughs> um, but but maybe we're like where where do you all think we're going next? Um, and we could start with papillary. Yeah. Well, what again as a general principle, one thing that just gets me so enthusiastic about seeing research, you know, like like Pavlos was was helping to publish, is that we've also moved away right from like Aspen and ESPN, where it's like, well. We don't understand all these cancers. Let's just bunch them together, call them non-clear cell, and and like we'll see what the non-clear cell response is, right? So now, you know, I I don't hear in these meetings anymore debates about should we do this or should we not. I think everyone's really committed to yes, we should because they're all biologically distinct. So the only way to really make progress is to treat them distinctly, um, and and that's really evident when you look at the you know of all the non-clear cell types we have you know the the greatest data for papillary but even if you look at papillary there's still so much to learn i mean even just over the past couple of months there's been a number of you know retrospective studies looking at very similar to you know what what pavlos was accomplishing with with chromophobe looking at uh, in retrospective multi-institution ways, what's the outcome of, you know, treating the patient, you know, with like this treatment versus that treatment. And each of these different publications shows you know, conflicting results, right? So some of the data shows that combination therapies up front are more effective. Some, some of the data shows that it's no more effective to do a combination compared to single agent sequential therapy. So there's still a lot we need to learn. Um, right now, we're at the point where we're using all of these therapies that were developed in clear cell in papillary, in part because the response rates are high enough, but we really need to eventually move on to the next iteration of trials where they're clearly developed around the fundamental biology of papillary. In the past, that was somewhat more problematic because papillary, by definition, was sort of a mishmash of all these different things, but with the updated WHO criteria, now that we're pulling out some of these other uh, diagnoses like FH deficient or translocation, which sometimes got lumped in, um, I think it's going to be easier to move on to that next generation. But at the moment, because we do have so many effective therapies, we are in a somewhat similar place with papillary compared to clear cell. We have a lot of tools that seem to work and we're trying to, the current clinical trials anyway, are trying to figure out how to optimize those uh, for the patients. Are you excited to see the um, randomized kind of phase threes that are actually ongoing specifically for papillary and in a non-clear cell setting? Well, one I'm particularly yeah. enthusiastic about, obviously. Um, but, but I think what it really goes to show is that not only do we have one randomized trial, um, PAPMIT2 obviously is the best one, right? <laughs> um, but, but it goes to show that as a community, we've really embraced this idea that we need to treat each disease distinct. Uh, you know, and and understand it in its sole entirety, right? And so we have trials in Europe doing this um, with like Paxipem. We have trials internationally, both, you know, that have a lot of centers here in the U.S. as well as internationally with, with things like the Stellar trial, um, it, you know, PatMet2 being a cooperative group. It's really just in the United States. Um, but, but the whole international community has really fully, I would argue, has fully embraced this idea of like, let's, explore each of these diagnoses independently. And, and, you know, these trials aren't looking at therapies designed specifically on the biology of papillary as it's distinctly different from, say, clear cell, but we're really trying to figure out how to optimize the tools we have. Um, so, so it is a step forward. I wouldn't say the biggest step forward, but, but we will make significant steps forward with this. And, and the other great thing is, as Pavlos was mentioning, is that there's data banks, you know, uh, tissue data banks being collected with all of these trials that will really help us move move the field forward. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. And um, as you said, it, even uh, if it is leading to, I mean, really, I won't say incremental because really these are, you know, our first attempts at a prospective, you know, 
a validating trial, but I think we'll continue to just gain more information in addition to the clinical response, understanding um, that that we'll get that biologic, you know, underpinning and ho hopefully drug design will follow that. I think the challenge is if there's not something already available on the market, it is a rare tumor. And so it's always a question of um, can you repurpose drugs? Can you get um, excitement in our uh, drug developing partners, our industry partners, you know, to think about rare subtypes. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited for, for PatMet too, and, and also hoping to, you know, learn a lot from, uh, you know, the, the cooperative uh, different efforts going on, chromophobe, uh, renal medullary, all, all these things. I think hopefully five years from now we'll be talking about what's the bio biology underpinning and maybe have, have novel therapies that we'll be able to, to target those. Yeah, I, I, you know, you bring up an interesting point about, you know, it, our capacity to be able to partner with other institutions, with, with industry. And I think what all of these trials really demonstrate is that there's an appetite amongst ourselves to learn this better, mm -hmm. but there's also an appetite in industry and governmental organizations to make these trials happen. You know whether they're a randomized study or it's some other type of, of clinical trial design. Yeah, and we are starting to see influx of data for non-clear cell uh, carcinoma for biomarkers. Actually, we do have a poster here at ASCO in papillary uh, RCC. We had through the Orion network. Uh, basically, this is a multicenter collaboration uh, where we are doing a whole exome sequencing, uh, NGS uh, or, or RNA seq, and uh, germline uh, on all those uh, patients. And we are presenting data on uh, 102 patients, I think, with papillary RCC and we found like there are a couple genes where uh, one of them is called YTHDF2, which is uh, which encodes a protein in the cell cycle uh, and and those uh, and another protein called uh, or another gene uh, sick. 31, both of them have uh, shown like inverse uh, relationship with, with survival. Uh, so this is one of the posters here at, at ASCO. So uh, along that same line, there are multiple other uh, networks are actually are doing like the CARIS uh, POA network uh, is doing a lot of work in the non-clear cell RCC. Uh, so I think these type of collaborative efforts uh, are the only way for us to move the needle forward in to better understand this uh, type of rare tumors. Now there is um, one thing I want to caution and uh, Monty Paul very astutely has sensed it um, and that is the oncoming debate about what Scott Hack and Kim Rathmel actually called, you know, the lumpers versus the splitters, which, you know, in, in the data science and lab world, we can use the term robustness and relevance. And, you know, that's the, the, the trade-off where, you know, you have robustness when you can change the conditions and you still get the same inferences. That's a very nice scenario for randomized trials like PAPMET um, and PAPMET2. That's what randomized trials do. They give you robust comparative inferences, specifically the uncertainty about it. But then there is the issue of relevance, hence the patient relevance. And that for that, we need to keep going deeper and deeper. Now, my caution is this. In the 20th century, there were intense debates using different language about whether we should be extremists on one side or extremists on the other side. No, don't be an extremist on either side. Use whatever is going to work for the patient at hand and the scenario at hand. Sometimes we may want to go for robustness and we may want to lump things together and do RCTs like PubMed, PubMed 2. Other times, and you know this is where I lean, you may want to, you know, go to subtype split, 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 and do, you know, sometimes single arm trials for hom more homogeneous groups, et cetera.